a secret at the heart of the government of Bangladesh. The Ahmed clan, a crime family at the center of power. We are not talking about some small time thief here or a small time robber here. We're talking about organized crime syndicate. The clan includes three convicted killers, at least one who protected the prime minister, Sheikh Hasina. He was personal bodyguard. He had direct contact with Hasina. Our investigation reveals how the head of the Bangladesh army keeps his fugitive brothers safe and helps them get rich. This is his brother, actually. His elder brother is running the country. He has the power of Bangladesh army. He has the power of his brothers because they are gangsters. They are mafia. The army chief helps the prime minister pursue absolute power. Sheikh Hasina has been very, very upfront and transparent about her goal of destroying the opposition. The Muslim-majority nation secretly buys spyware from Israel, a country it officially doesn't recognize. I could never say Bangladesh Army is my customer for this. We cannot do that. It's spyware that can track political enemies. It is highly intrusive and it is indiscriminate. It can hardly ever be compliant with human rights. A Dakar crime family says it has the tools of the state at its disposal. An international conference on disaster management is taking place in Singapore. Among those attending, the head of the Bangladesh military. Aziz Ahmed is a four-star general. His title, Chief of Army Staff. I always look at General Aziz and I see one of the most ambitious military officers I have ever seen in Bangladesh. Al Jazeera's eye unit tracks the general's movements. When his official duties are over, he flies to Kuala Lumpur, the Malaysian capital. On the plane, he sends a text message to a contact called Hassan Hungary. Waiting at the airport are two men, identified from police files. They are Aziz's brothers. One is the man Aziz referred to in his text, Hassan Hungary. His real name, Haris Ahmed. He fled a murder conviction and now lives under a false identity. He calls himself Mohammed Hassan. Also waiting is the youngest of the Ahmed clan, Joseph. He served more than 20 years in jail for the same killing. There appears to be a last minute change of plan. Instead of meeting his brothers in public, the general exits using a diplomatic channel. Brothers leave the airport in separate cars. They regroup at a gated house in downtown Kuala Lumpur. Diplomatic cars from the Bangladesh High Commission are parked outside. Our surveillance team watches the property. The following day, the general returns with his younger brother, Joseph. Then another man emerges from behind the gates. General Aziz has led us to the oldest of the Ahmed clan, Anis. Anis Ahmed has been on the run since his conviction for the same murder as his brothers. He's built a prosperous life in his new homeland. 
Property records identify two owners of the house where the clan is staying. Anis Ahmed and Muhammad Hassan. Oh, that's Harris, the brother of Aziz. And this man is Anis Ahmed, the other brother. He's also absconding. Interestingly, he hasn't changed his name. The Ahmed clan sets off escorted by diplomatic cars. They head to the Bangladesh High Commission for the evening. At one time, they were a backstreet gang. Now, they are expanding their power in Bangladesh and increasing their wealth abroad. Aziz, the general. Anis, the fugitive we found in Malaysia. Joseph, jailed for two decades. And Haris, a killer on the run. The investigation moves to Hungary. For the past five years, Haris Ahmed has lived a double life in the Hungarian capital. Harris is a very cold-blooded criminal. He is someone who would harm you if he doesn't like you. I got to understand that this person is not a very normal person. He is kind of a psychopath. Business associate speaks to us. So it all started back in 2014, December. I received a phone call from an acquaintance of mine that General Aziz Ahmed is visiting Hungary. He requested me if I can accompany him during his visit because there is no Bangladesh embassy here in Hungary. Sami took him sightseeing. The general had a proposal. He asked me that if I can assist him to set up a business for his brother, who is living in India at that moment. I said, sure, if he wants to establish his business, I can assist him. After leaving from Budapest, I received a mail from General Aziz, where he asked what are the things involved to establish the business. I replied him, what are the with the detailed requirements of paperwork. Nothing of it raised any alarm to me. I have seen on all documents that his name is Muhammad Hassan. And I was not that curious to check or go through his documents. And as it comes from someone like General Aziz, there is no point that I would doubt any authenticity of his documents. We've obtained the fake documents used to build up Haris Ahmed's new identity. It includes a passport. It's signed by Umar Kulsum, an official from the Department of Immigration and Passports. She was later charged as part of a criminal network involved in passport fraud. In order to get a fake passport, you need to get a fake national identity card. And in order to get a fake national identity card, you need to falsify a number of different documents, which could include a fake birth certificate, an education certificate, a marriage certificate. And in getting all of these documents within Bangladesh, he's committing a host of different criminal offences within the country. And then, of course, he then used that to get a passport, and that passport is a fake passport under a false name. And in flying under that passport, he would have committed offences in all of the countries that he travelled to. The documents were sent from General Aziz's office. At the time, Aziz was head of the Border Guards Bangladesh, or BGB. Oh, this is really interesting. The witnesses on this document are Major Sujal Haq, 
and Brigadier General Abul Hasnat. They're both in BGB and they were both in BGB at the time when General Aziz was the head of BGB. So presumably, Aziz has managed to get these men to sign a document which is a forgery. Another BGB officer, Major Sami Rashid, sent this email with Aziz copied. It certifies a bank account held in Bangladesh by a Mohammed Hassan. A delivery note shows Major Rashid's role in shipping the fake documents. So in order to commit this fraud, to make it work, to get the signatures, to send it to Hungary, General Aziz has managed to make a variety of different senior military officers as accomplices. Haris Ahmed arrives in Budapest in early summer 2015. Documents obtained by the I unit chart his efforts to build a new life under the direction of his brother, General Aziz. He sets up the Bay of Bengal company. His wife, daughter and son-in-law are co-owners. The Bay of Bengal is an umbrella company covering a number of businesses. There is a clothes shop called Niveau Fashion. General Aziz inspects the family investment. But the shop closes after six months. Bay of Bengal purchases another company, Taylorville. Next, it opens a restaurant in the heart of the city. It shuts down after five months. There is a hostel business providing cheap accommodation. It's called Bengal Hostel and closes within a year. Graham Barrow advises banks on how to prevent money laundering. This is highly indicative of structures put together for criminal intent. Are you looking for any business that generates large amounts of cash? It's like restaurants, hotels still do a lot of cash businesses, or hostels. Technically, it's called commingling, which is like mingling dirty money with clean money, so that you can't tell which is which. Harris doesn't seem to care about his businesses. The Bay of Bengal reports a string of losses, losing thousands of dollars in various failed ventures. He would go out, drink at bars. If he would meet some woman, he would bring them to the hostel and they would party. He really doesn't match a businessman's profile to me. Sami discovers that Haris's financial interests lie elsewhere. Haris acts as a middleman who uses his connections to secure deals, especially official Bangladesh government contracts. Haris wants Sami to help with a contract to supply Hungarian-made bullets to the Bangladesh army. Haris wants to use Sami as a frontman. Harris finds out that a deal for military supplies to Bangladesh is taking place without his knowledge. He plans to stop it. He would start making phone calls to Bangladesh to different individuals 
he will bully them in very nasty way. He will abuse those people whom he is calling. Haris is calling a senior officer in the DGFI, Bangladesh's military intelligence. <laughs> Harris tells Sami more about his business operation. Haris says his role as a middleman is sanctioned by the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina. The destiny of the Ahmed clan has long been entwined with the story of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. She is the eldest daughter of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who founded Bangladesh as an independent nation in 1971. The country faces the aftermath of war. There is poverty and starvation. Law and order break down. As the crisis escalates, Sheikh Mujib abolishes opposition parties. The army stages a coup. Hasina and her sister are in Europe. The ambassador from Germany, he called. So he told me that there, there was a coup in Bangladesh. The moment I heard it, my feeling was that then nobody is there. Perhaps we lost everybody. But still, we didn't know what really happened. Army officers enter Sheikh Mujib's home. He is murdered along with 13 family members, including his 10-year-old son. The murder of Sheikh Mujib and his family was one of the most brutal episodes in the history of Bangladesh. The murderers even did not spare his little son. A large part of Sheikh Hasina's politics is shaped by her quest for justice, by her mission to avenge the killings. Less than two kilometers from where Sheikh Mujib is murdered, the Ahmed family lives in a sprawling district called Mohammedpur. Aziz is the second of five boys and a young teenager at the time. They would grown up in a very poor condition. Iqbal knew the family. He asked us to conceal his identity. His father had a low level job and whatever he earned, they couldn't run their family. Growing up amongst poverty and political strife, the five young Ahmed brothers form a close-knit bond. But Aziz stands out. In 1981, he joins the Bangladesh army. The other four, Anis, Haris, Joseph, and another brother, Tipu, they turn to crime. They were extorting money. They were doing kidnapping. They became a gang. It started from very small. Then they started killing people. They had a specific area in Dhaka around Muhammadpur, which they controlled, which they sort of divided amongst themselves with other crime bosses of Dhaka city. 
and they would go and extort businesses and they ruled over that area as if it was their personal fiefdoms. These are criminals that we're talking about. They are killers who have caused significant amount of, amount of damage to human life. While living in exile in India, Sheikh Hasina becomes leader of the Awami League, the party her father had led. In 1981, she returns to Bangladesh. I started to mobilize people. The then government tried to prevent me so that I shouldn't come back. But I decided to accept it and come back to work for democracy. The military is now running the country, and several times Hasina is placed under house arrest. There are attacks on her life. The I unit has obtained covertly recorded phone calls of General Aziz speaking to a colleague. The conversations took place in 2020. Aziz describes how his brothers protected the leaders of Sheikh Hasina's party, the Awami League. My brothers, they were the main strength of this party. Kendrio Netherisha, Amar Chodove, Official Bisha Tarabulo, party Hulu program, even the announced for Tara, Karo Ono de Katara, Nira Ponogotona to Tara Chiriati. The clan is feared, but also faces vengeance. One brother, Tipu, is murdered. Tipu, he was a very renowned gangster, very sharpshooter, very intelligent. Among the brothers, he was the most intelligent person. It was a time when politicians and the street gangs needed each other. These kinds of gangs, they were involved in extortion, petty street crimes, extracting money from businessmen. But they also acted as muscle for politicians when required. They tended to link up with certain politicians and they were used by politicians in particular moments when it served their interests. In the mid-1990s, Haris Ahmed joins Hasina's personal protection team. This is Haris, Sheikh Hasina. Iqbal remembers Haris from that period. He is around Hasina's security, personal security. And that meeting was in Muhammadpur. That is Haris's area. He organized all the meetings. He was personal bodyguard. General Aziz recalls a recent statement by Sheikh Hasina to party leaders. Honorable Sheikh Jayet the Prime Minister compares the loyalty of the Ahmed clan, who protected her when she was attacked, to the inaction of the senior politicians surrounding her now. A murder on a busy street in Mohammedpur will define the Ahmed clan's future. Mustafa Rahman is said to be from a rival political party, one linked to the killing of Sheikh Hasina's family. Mustafa and two colleagues are surrounded. Mustafa is rushed to hospital. He gives a witness statement to a magistrate. Joseph, Harris and Anis have shot me. Harris shot me with a licensed gun. 
Joseph took the pistol from my waist and shot me in the stomach with it. The others also had pistols in their hands and they shot at random. I was shot nine times. Five days later, he dies. With his testimony, he becomes the key witness at his own murder trial. One month after Mustafa Rahman's murder, Sheikh Hasina becomes Bangladesh's new prime minister. The three Ahmed brothers are charged with murder. Eight years later, when Hasina is no longer in power, they're convicted. Joseph is sentenced to death. Anis and Haris are sentenced to life imprisonment. But they're already on the run. For 15 years, they're not found until the I unit tracks them down. Haris Ahmed was one of the top gangsters of the country who was being hunted by the police. Anis Ahmed, he was accused for a very brutal murder. I don't think that they could have fled the country without some sort of help from some powerful people. The sequence of events is quite interesting. Around 1994, 95, Harris, he acted as her bodyguard. Then a year later, 1996, a murder of somebody who is said to be a political rival to Sheikh Hasina took place in which the three brothers, including Harris, were subsequently convicted. But maybe she feels the less she knows about all of that, the better. Sami discovers that his business partner, Haris Ahmed, is a wanted murderer on an Interpol red notice list. I felt that I have been used as a tool to provide a passage to a safe country for this man who established business with my assistants. And I felt that Mr. Haris and General Aziz have used me. I thought of reporting him to the police but again, I was fearful of my life. Sami tries to cut ties with the Ahmed clan. But when he does, the general sends him threatening emails. General Aziz became very violent with his words. He became very furious. He sent me emails where he directly threatened me. And he said that if his brother has to return to Bangladesh, then people responsible will regret their life. General Aziz keeps trying to draw Sami into his web. He's moving his money out of Bangladesh for life after the military. He wants to find businesses to invest his money in. By 2019, Sami's had enough, but he goes along with their schemes. Except now, he's working with the I unit. Harris is flying in from a business trip. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, 
Harris arrives with Mohammed Rahman, a financial advisor from Canada. Rahman runs an immigration service that helps wealthy Bangladeshis acquire residency abroad. Harish's assistant is with the team. <laughs> Yusuf Ali handles Harish's bookkeeping. <laughs> The discussion turns to Haris's political influence in Bangladesh. His associates know Haris has connections to the Prime Minister. Despite his apparent lack of business success, Haris has significant sums of money to invest. Haris and Rahman want to buy a hotel. Sami is showing them around. How many rooms do you have? 66. 66 six six rooms. Yeah. We got a 7.2 million euro. 7.2 million Bangla Kotaya. Only hotel is more viable than this one. The Bay of Bengal, the umbrella company for Harish's investments, has an office in this building. It's above a goulash restaurant, owned by Harish. Next door is an unlicensed foreign exchange bureau. That too belongs to Harish. It's manned by his assistant, Yusuf Ali. Yusuf confirms to Sami that Harith's main source of funds is government contracts from Bangladesh. A letter from the Bay of Bengal company contains the proposal for a consignment of military bunk beds. It's addressed to the Director General of Border Guards Bangladesh, the BGB. It's dated November 2015. The Director General of the BGB is Harris's brother, Aziz. Patronage appears to provide Harris with ample earning opportunities. Serious. <laughs> Yusuf says that Haris acts as a middleman and fixes army contracts for the right price. <laughs> The I unit obtains evidence that Haris Ahmed is establishing an investment portfolio outside of Hungary. Using the same false identity, he builds a French business empire. In 2018, he buys a stake in a company which deals in computers and IT. The company has two registered offices. One on the outskirts of Paris sells mobile phones and offers international money transfer services. The pace picks up in 2019. In the space of just seven months, Harris buys stakes in four more companies. In April, he found Snigda, which owns a fast food outlet. Then in May, he buys a stake in a retail company called TPTY. He sells it shortly after. 
This pattern and style of doing business is not inconsistent with money laundering. The construction of companies, company types, jurisdictions, bank accounts, the whole range of activities that he has been involved in are entirely consistent with um, schemes put together to funnel criminal funds through the system in order to make them look legitimate. There is absolutely the ability to hide in plain sight. So the busier the financial centre, the easier it is to lose a bit of dirty money in it. In June 2019, he registers the Bay of Bengal in France, which owns an Indian restaurant. And in November, another new company called Info Bay of Bengal. This store is at the company's registered address. He's connected to three properties in the Paris suburbs, including one with an estimated value of nearly half a million dollars. Corporate filings reveal a buying spree by Harris, who's moving money into France under his fake European Union residency. It's introducing the money into the system, layering, moving that money between lots of different companies and countries and then integration, putting it back into the real economy. Well, what better place to put it back into than property? It is the traditional home of dirty money. Harris's role as a middleman includes working with private companies in Europe that wish to invest in Bangladesh. Mohamed Rahman, the Canadian businessman, comes to help Harris negotiate a potential deal worth a fortune. Harris and Rahman are told that British financiers are looking to invest millions of dollars in the hotel trade in Bangladesh. Sami organizes a video conference with a British investment firm. Harris uses his assumed name. Hello. Hi, good morning. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm yes, hello. I'm Hi. Mom Hassan. Mahai, pleased to meet you. Yes. So my name is Mr. Rahman from Canada, Vancouver. Pleased to meet you too. But this is not what it seems. The representative of the investment firm is working for the I unit. To do something in Bangladesh is really great idea, but there's some problems because of still there's political issues and a little bit corruption so of course all the you know the country is coming up has such a problem but good things for mr hassan because he is um, very well connected with uh, the high officials very connected with the government especially the prime minister herself in return for his high level contacts aris demands a commission of 20 percent just one second, please. He breaks down the fake investment proposal. Sponsor is 100,000 euro, dollar or euro, or 100 billion. It is invested with the five star by any business. Daka, Ikortaja, for land by purchase, at a million and niche kuno money suitable with the rubber shop. Amade Jita will take 20% for. Then Rahman spells out how they work. Then he will send this letter to his elder brother and will officially visit your place to talk a little bit more. If needed, we'll call our High Commission in London. So High Commission people also will be in the meeting to make it real official something. Then he can take this proposal to our Prime Minister and the Army Chiefs, which looks better and solid and concrete. So his company will be your consultant for Bangladesh. Basically, at this moment, his elder brother is running the country, in fact, because our prime minister leave everything to army chief to run the country for the big developments. This is his brother, actually.
Sheikh Hasina must call an election. A year earlier, she'd appointed Aziz head of border guards Bangladesh. As her Awami League government faces election defeat, the BGB becomes involved in overseeing the vote. Aziz was head of the BGB. His role was to quieten the opposition, prevent them taking control of the streets, preventing them being a political force which the government couldn't deal with. He was very proud of that. And he said that he was the one who handed those elections to Sheikh Hasina. And it was a very crucial moment. It was very possible at that time that the Wamili government could have fallen. A few years later, Sheikh Hasina visits Aziz to discuss his future. The general believes his loyalty is about to be rewarded. <laughs> For the general's career to advance, his brother's murder convictions would need to be dealt with. The plan includes getting Aziz's youngest brother out of jail. Joseph had already had his death sentence commuted to life in prison. For 11 years, he'd been on death row. In 2018, on the advice of the Prime Minister, Joseph is granted a presidential pardon. Tasneem Khalil is told about the pardon by a source in the military. I was a bit surprised that why um, this army person is talking to me about a top criminal getting a pardon because I was I did not make that connection instantly. And then he started laughing. And then he said, you realize one cannot become the chief of the army when his brother is in prison on murder charges. A month later, General Aziz Ahmed becomes army chief. I mean, that's when I realized, OK, he's talking about General Aziz. And this is not really about Joseph, the criminal, but it is about Aziz, the general. It's pretty extraordinary. Sheikh Hasina thought that General Aziz was an appropriate person to appoint as chief of army staff. So you have to ask, why was she so willing to take that risk? In December, Sheikh Hasina holds another election. General Aziz helps her consolidate power. In 2018, army played a very active role and assisted the massive rigging that went on in nearly every voting center in Bangladesh. The leader of the opposition and Hasina's longtime rival, Khalid Azir, is in jail. Others detained and never seen again. Sheikh Hasina has been very, very upfront and transparent about her goal of destroying the opposition. She's basically trying to um, brand herself and her family as being synonymous with the state. The opposition has been significantly repressed. They can barely function as an opposition. The law enforcement authorities have been able to act with tremendous impunity in relationship to extrajudicial killings and enforcement disappearances, which have to some extent become systemic now within the whole way in which the country operates. The I unit has obtained documents that reveal how Bangladesh's security forces gather information on Sheikh Hasina's opponents. 
The files include a contract to purchase spyware dated June the 26th, 2018, the day after General Aziz took control of the army. It is stamped and signed by the Directorate General Defense Purchase, the body charged with buying Bangladesh's military supplies. In February 2019, I was contacted by a friend of mine who was serving with the DGFI. A group of four Bangladeshi officers are visiting Budapest for some official reason. The officers are from Bangladesh's military intelligence service. I invited them for dinner. They said they will have three more guests with them. The three additional guests include two Israelis and an Irish national. But the two Israelis, who are intelligence experts, decide not to attend dinner. Only the Irishman gets out. The Bangladeshi officers introduced me to the guy, and he introduced himself as a contractor for some surveillance equipment company. I heard them discussing about purchasing this spyware, this uh, device that they can uh, basically conduct surveillance on general people's mobile phone. The contractor said, that no way that people in Bangladesh should know that this product comes from Israel. And that is when I decided to turn on my recorder. My company is based in Singapore. Okay. So I am the selling agent. The middleman for the deal is James Maloney from Sovereign Systems. We can supply um, Wi-Fi interception, uh, as well as cellular, as well as uh, video surveillance. The documents confirm that Bangladesh is indirectly buying surveillance equipment from a company in Israel. Pick 6 was founded by former Israeli intelligence experts. Bangladesh has no diplomatic relations with Israel and cannot legally trade with it. The Bangladesh passport prohibits travel to Israel. Bangladesh has the world's fourth largest Muslim population. It says it won't recognize Israel until there's an independent Palestinian state. The Bangkok-based Maloney acts as the facilitator. But even his company's website includes no reference to Pick 6. It's from Israel, yeah. So, yeah, so we don't advertise that technology. We don't put the cellular interception or Wi-Fi interception on the website. We're very careful about our public profile. The Israelis train the four Bangladesh intelligence officers in a warehouse outside Budapest. We've blurred the images of the Bangladeshi officers. James Maloney is in the middle. We've been unable to identify the two Israeli intelligence experts. Pick 6 did not respond to our request for comment. The spyware's manual describes the P6 intercept, also called an IMSI catcher or stingray, as a mobile phone monitoring system. It behaves like a cell tower, so all of the phones in a certain area are going to connect to it and it's going to be capable of intercepting communications. Everything you're doing on your phone, text messages, phone call, but also the website you visit are going to be intercepted. Up to two or three hundred mobile phones can be connected to it simultaneously. The specific model is also capable of um, uh, interfering with the communications. So you're going to be able to change the content of a text message. You could be spoofing the identity of someone. Israeli technology can now be used to monitor and quell further protest. It is a tool of mass surveillance. The sort of use we've seen is to kind of identify groups of people and to determine the networks that exist. So you know there is one person who's going to be there. You're going to the place, whether it's a protest again or a gathering, and you're looking at everybody who's in the area, and so you can keep investigating and having more people under surveillance at the same time. 
the technology is very aggressive and intrusive. You don't want the public to know that you're using that equipment. The final contract contains the condition that the supplier and the Bangladesh military sign a non-disclosure agreement. It also hides its origin. Instead, it states, made in Hungary. Knowledge is power. So if you know what people are saying, where they're going to meet up, uh, what they're planning to do, you can know a lot of things. And then you have the power to act. Harris claims he can use Bangladesh's security services to monitor the phones of rivals. He says a paramilitary unit called the Rapid Action Battalion tracked a phone for him. The head of RAB at the time is Benazir Ahmed, here with Harris's brother Joseph after his release from prison. When you go to Harry says he's used Rab to track a phone and make an arrest. Salim Prodhan was convicted of gambling offences and jailed for six months. In April 2020, Benazir Ahmed moves from Rab to become the most powerful policeman in Bangladesh. Harris prefers not to attract attention by directly involving his brother. He says he's involved in a network of corruption, placing policemen in jobs that earn bribes and paying a cut to their superiors. In Mohammedpur, the district where the Ahmed clan grew up, there's further evidence the brothers are using the Rapid Action Battalion to serve their own ends. A local politician, Mizan Rahman, is arrested. Although he's in Sheikh Hasina's party, the Awami League, he's also the brother of Mustafa Rahman, the man murdered by Harris, Joseph and Anis. I had the bullet. It's really, very shocking news for us. And I didn't know why. Mahadi was a boy when his uncle was murdered. It's a very terrible moment. It's a brutal murder. He now lives abroad. He says General Aziz is using Rab to punish his family. It was his uncle's testimony that sent Joseph to prison and Haris and Anis on the run. Most of the people who is involving in rap, like Lieutenant Colonel or Colonel, they're really close to General Aziz. If General Aziz said, yeah, okay, do it, so that they can do it, because they had the command of General Aziz. 
people in Bangladesh are scared to death of Rab. If Rab is after them, they will run away. And we've seen many cases of human rights activists, women's rights activists, even internal critics inside the Iwami League who have fled the country because they heard Rab was going to come knocking at their door. He has the power of Bangladesh Army. He has the power of his brothers because they are gangsters. They are mafia. In a nearby ward in Mohammedpur, a young member of the Ahmed clan is running for election. Asif Ahmed is the nephew of General Aziz and son of Anis, who lives in Kuala Lumpur. In January 2020, Asif launches his political career. He wins on an anti-corruption platform. the grounds of the army's national headquarters in Dakar, a high society wedding. The groom, dressed in gold, is General Aziz Ahmed's eldest son. I didn't expect him to be dancing quite like that. Well, that's Aziz, that is Harris. Harris is accounting for murder, and here he is at a big society wedding with the chief of army staff there. As well as Haris, Anis is visiting from Malaysia. This is jaw-dropping stuff. Like, these are gangsters wanted by Bangladesh police officially, and they're attending a wedding, and the army chief is right there. They're partying, really. The country's senior military officers, political elite, and foreign dignitaries are in attendance. And the youngest of the brothers, Joseph, convicted of murder but pardoned, is also here. Oh, wow, that's Bangladesh's president. The pardon came from the president, Mohammed Abdul Hamid. The president of Bangladesh is at a wedding with these two absconding criminals and who should be arrested. Anas's son is also celebrating. He's the emerging politician campaigning on an anti-corruption ticket. The next generation is properly in place. If the same regime continues, we can see that the second generation of these people would take place and turn Bangladesh into an absolute mafia state. I feel that I have been relieved of a great responsibility that I had to share the truth, to expose these culprits to the world. 
And of course, I am fearful. I feel afraid. I am feeling scared that they will come after me. 